Okay, welcome to this first exercise in module 15, dealing with uh, multiple linear regression models. So, as I said in the, uh, the introduction video, uh, given that uh, when I teach this course, the, the, the math prerequisites are a little bit limiting uh, in the extent of the calculations that, uh, that we can do. So we don't have a matrix algebra um, prerequisite. So I can't now give a data set and have students uh, calculate uh, those coefficients, those parameter estimates. So the extent of the problems that we'll be doing in this module is really just like this. We'll start off here we've got this looks like a, a demand a demand curve so my expected quantity demanded is a function of it looks like I have my own price so here we have own price PX price of a related good advertising expenditures and income. So I've got my regression equation and then we're just going to estimate this and actually I, just, I say we but really I mean me I estimate this here we've got our, our uh, results from that estimation and now what we're going to do is just go through this, uh, this output and we'll deal with a few of the, um, the different issues that may arise um, or just how to extract information from from this output. So we have our demand equation. We've got all of our information here on our different variables. All of the prices are measured in dollars. Advertising and income, so this, these two here are measured in thousands of dollars. It's always really important to, to remember those units of measurement because that affects your interpretation of the coefficients. So part A, write out the estimated regression equation. So from this output, there's a whole bunch of numbers here. Uh, sometimes it's hard to sort of filter down into the ones that are relevant. But uh, in this exercise here, we've got all of our coefficients that we need to write out our estimated regression equation. So this is just, I'll just write it in generic terms. So y hat, we know this is an estimate for the expected uh, quantity demanded, the average quantity demanded. And I have my intercept is 686.6 minus the slope on its own price, 11.6 times its own price. Slope on the uh, price of a related good, 12, negative 12.2 plus advertising. I'm just going to round everything to one decimal here. And uh, this is on advertising expenditures plus 6.6, I guess, on income. Oh, what did I do here? 12.2 on uh, PY. Okay, so there's our estimated regression equation. Uh, normally I would say, oh, it's as simple as that, but of course I made a little mistake myself. So that's it. We've got all of our estimated coefficients. Uh, our next step is probably interpret these coefficients and the corresponding interval estimates. So if we look at each of our coefficients on our slopes, well, what does these tell us? These are just those marginal effects. So if there's a, a one unit change in the corresponding independent variable, that partial slope or that estimated coefficient that tells us what's the impact on our dependent variable. So if we look at price, so its own price, and that coefficient is negative 11.6 and price is measured in dollars. So what this, what this means is that if this product's own price increases by $1, the impact on quantity demanded is that it will decrease because this is a negative relationship. So for every dollar that this product's price increases, uh, our estimate of the average quantity demanded will fall by uh, 11.6. For each dollar increase in the price of a related good, so if we look at PY, uh, each dollar increase in the price of a related good, uh, quantity demanded of this product will fall by 12.26. So these two goods, they, they must be complements. They must be two goods that are often sold together um, because if the price of one good, of this good, causes the demand for this one to fall, well, they must be something that is sold together. But that's a lecture for an economics course, so I won't dwell too much on it here. Um, on advertising, 
this is now measured in thousands of dollars so when we say here a one unit increase in advertising expenditures we're really talking about a one thousand dollar increase in advertising expenditures so so this slope here is 6.4 this is telling us for each additional thousand dollars that is spent on advertising expenditures that will increase uh, average quantity demanded by 6.4 and on income over here, this is also measured in thousands of dollars. So a one unit increase is a $1,000 increase. So for every $1,000 increase in income, uh, we can expect uh, an increase of 6.6 uh, in terms of our average quantity demanded. So that's all there is in terms of est uh, interpreting those marginal effects. When we look at these confidence interval estimates, so if we come down here, well, now these are all 95% interval estimates. So if we talk about its own price, for every dollar increase uh, in its own price, quantity demanded will fall by 11.64. We can say, well, I'm 95% confident that that decrease in quantity demanded will be somewhere between, I don't like this pink, will be somewhere between uh, 16 and a half and 6.7. So again, this is that point estimate my point estimate, if price increases for every dollar price increases, quantity demanded will fall by 11.6. I'm 95% confident, so an interval estimate for every dollar increase, uh, quantity demanded, I should be saying average quantity demanded, uh, will fall by between 16 and 6, or 6.7. Okay, same on uh, price of a related good, so that's a point estimate. If the price of a related good increases by a dollar, uh, quantity demanded or average quantity demanded here will fall by 12.2. Our confidence interval estimate, well, I am, that's a point estimate, but I'm 95% confident that uh, quantity demanded will fall somewhere between, let's say, 18 and 6.5. Okay, I'm kind of being loose with my rounding here. On advertising expenditures, same thing point estimate, every thousand dollars we spend on advertising contributes 6.4 uh, to, to quantity demanded. 95% confident that increase to quantity demanded will be between, uh, let's call it 2 and 11. And same on income. For every thousand dollar increase in income, average quantity demanded goes up about six and a half. 95% confident that that's going to be between no negative 1.4 and 15 and a half. So that's something a little bit different there. We have a negative, which means that there's a zero somewhere within that interval estimate. And that, gee, that doesn't look like anything, does it? <laughs> so when we're looking at these intervals, right? Remember this. So this one here has a negative value and a positive value. So zero is somewhere in there, and that's going to come back to have some meaning. Oh, I just drew right behind my face. So this was our negative, this was our positive, so there's a zero in there. And that's related to, I think we'll get to this in part D, because that has meaning as well. So let's come back to that average income estimate. Uh, okay, so we're done A, we're done B, we've interpreted all of our point estimates and our intervals interpret the r squared so for a multiple regression we really have two r squares that uh, that are relevant so this is the r squared this is the one that is the same as um, the simple linear regression ssr over sst so we can say well our regression has captured 85 percent of the total variation in quantity demanded so uh, we can even elaborate further. The product's own price, the price of this related product, advertising expenditure and income, all together can capture or explain 85% of the total variation in uh, quantity demanded. Now, in a multiple regression, we actually prefer the adjusted R-squared. The adjusted R-squared, it's basically all it does is it penalizes us for adding unnecessary uh, independent variables. Because given, I won't get into the mathematics of it here, but 
if the r squared, if we understand the r squared as a measure of goodness of fit, it's, a, it's a, a metric for the strength of our regression, well, there might be a tendency to want to maximize that, to try to make that r squared as large as possible. But because of how these parameters are estimated, it's, remember it's this whole sum of squares thing. Well, if, if I'm summing a bunch of squares, there's no negative effects. A negative value can never arise, so I can add more and more independent variables without ever having a negative effect on the R squared. So it can lead to these models getting inflated and having way too many independent variables. So the adjusted R squared, it has here this K, remember K is the number of, of um, coefficients that we're estimating, and for each independent variable that we add, uh, of course, we're estimating one more coefficient. So the adjusted R squared then, it basically penalizes the researcher for adding independent variables that fail to contribute significantly to the R squared. So the R squared itself will never go down if I add more independent variables. The adjusted R squared now, it can go down if that additional independent variable doesn't contribute significantly to the overall regression. So here I have an R squared is 85, so our regression captures 85% of the total variation in our dependent variable. An adjusted R squared of 0.81. Can't really interpret it as a percentage anymore just because of how this is being calculated. You can still, it might be helpful to think of it still as a percentage, but technically we can't. Uh, think of it just as a measure, just as a metric of um, the goodness of fit of your regression model. So 0.81, it's still quite quite high, still indicative of a fairly strong fit. Okay, so that's our R squared. Let's come down, interpret the results of individual parameter significance. So here we can go through this fairly quickly. All of these all of these tests, if we look at, uh, we're just looking first of all at individual parameter significance. So those all have a null and alternative hypotheses that the individual parameter is equal to zero or not equal to zero. All of the rejection rules are the same from all of the other hypothesis tests that we've done. So here if we do all of these tests at the alpha 05 level of significance, we reject any that have a p-value less than or equal to that level of significance. So if we look through here, it looks like our y-intercept is significant. That's, um, at this point, it doesn't really matter. That's fine, it's not, um, so all this means is that our line doesn't go through the origin, it doesn't go through zero. Uh, our own price, okay, so its own price is significant. So its own price is a statistically valid predictor uh, of quantity demanded, that's what we would expect. The price of related good is also significant, so that price of that other good, that other product, it is statistically significant in predicting quantity demanded of, of this product. Advertising is statistically significant, so quantity demanded in this of this product, it is related to advertising expenditures. Now the p-value on average income is 10, or point, point 0.1. This now is consistent with what we saw in that confidence interval estimate where this was negative 1.4 and this was positive 14.6. And at that point, well, we're 95% confident that the marginal effect of income on quantity demanded was between negative 1.4 and 14.6, which means that at that level of confidence, I can't say that it's not zero. It, zero is a possibility. So the corresponding hypothesis test here I have a p-value of 0.1, so for that one we cannot reject, we do not reject this hypothesis, meaning I'm unable to say that it's different from zero. It's a possibility that it's zero at that level of significance, so we fail to reject that null hypothesis. So what that would mean then is the next step, which we won't get to here, but the next step would be then, well, okay, I've identified that income does not matter, so this product must be some sort of a necessity regardless of, of income. Uh, so what we would do in the next case, if we wanted to revise these estimates, uh, we would take income out of the model, and we would then rerun the regression and, and obtain new estimates 
uh, for these remaining uh, coefficients once we've identified that income I guess it doesn't belong in the model that which is an interesting result in itself given that this is a demand curve so there we've got uh, all of our tests are done everything is significant except income now the next one estimate the expected quantity sold or uh, quantity demanded when the prices of the two goods are 25 and 15 advertising is 30,000 and average income is 45,000 so now what we need to do I'm just going to clear myself some space here so now we can use this for estimation we've gone through looking at the regression analysis and using it in terms of understanding the marginal effects of incremental changes so the marginal relationship between quantity demanded and each of these independent variables now we can also use it for prediction so what that means is I just have here's my my estimated regression equation and now we just plug in our values so the price of X is 25 price of Y is 15 advertising expenditures are 30,000 now keep in mind advertising expenditures measured in thousands so I don't put 30,000 in we just put 30 that means 30,000 and income we know it's statistically insignificant but we don't have a revised model so we'll just go with it here uh, income is 45,000 that's also measured in thousands of dollars so I just put in 45 Okay, now the rest of this is just using, I'll use this calculator as much as I hate using it. Hopefully I won't make a silly mistake right at the end of this video. So 686.6 minus 11.6 times 25 minus 12.2 times 15 plus 6.4 times 30 plus 6.6 .6 times 45 and we have a estimate of 702.6 so there we go and given those levels for each of those independent variables here's now my estimate in this case this is our uh, estimate of quantity demanded or the estimate of average quantity demanded given those prices and and those incomes and advertising expenditures okay so that's oh I forgot one little thing I left out this test for overall model significance shoot okay let me come back to that my mistake sorry for the confusion this one here this is our test for the overall significance of the model uh, beta 1 is equal to beta 2 is equal to beta 3 how many do I have 1 2 3 and 4 and those are all simultaneously equal to 0 or not all are 0 phew glad I didn't forget that so this is our ANOVA exercise this is looking at this Excel calls this significant F but this is our p-value so this is really testing to see is this model significant are all of these variables together statistically significant so here we have a p-value of zero so if we perform this test at the 05 level of significance well here we can quite comfortably reject and we do show that uh, it appears as though uh, our model is statistically significant not all of these are equal to zero and uh, the test on individual parameters that we've done uh, seems to confirm that as well now sometimes it's possible to find some conflict between these two results and that's part of why it's uh, useful to to do the test for overall significance and individual parameter significance and we'll continue to do that in some of the other videos so okay now I think I've I've covered everything so I hope this makes sense uh, we will do a couple of more videos um, in this module of course and we'll get some more practice okay thank you so much for watching bye bye